But you know, to make it simple, although we learned a new classification in the last presentation by Mr. Gandor, I return to the traditional classification of the ENT. And this is, let us differentiate and understand the adductor and adductor spasmodic dysphonia. It might become difficult if you have a mixed one, and it becomes even more difficult if you have a combination with voice tremor. The adduction spasmodic dysphonia, if it is a clear adductor spasmodic dysphonia, is the one you know with the cramps of the voice, very hard combination. But what is a very interesting thing, if you do laryngeal stroboscopy in these patients, you usually have a clear, regular vibration of the vocal folds. Because the classical definition considers that <coughs> it is a speaking task induced problem and not a singing one. When I started to deal with the spasmodic dysphonia, the classic or the typical adductor spasmodic dysphonia can sing. So, and when we have the abductor, then you will be um, teach that this is the one what is breathy because the vocal fold do not close. Easy. So, uh, if you have again the symptom what we have heard, uh, the patient, uh, is it spasmodic? Uh, is it tremor? Is it both? So it is really complicated to have a combination with tremor. And another, just, ah, uh -huh. how does it work? Like this. Oh. Here we have the spasmodic symptoms after an ischemic stroke. Is it really the ent entity of a spasmodic dysphonia or is it just a symptom of a neurological disorder? So it's really not easy. So when we try to go into the diagnostics, then I would like to use here this table. What do we expect for a spasmodic dysphonia? We expect a normal structure. I start very simple, very simple. If you start to see these patients, make sure that the structure at rest of the vocal folds is normal. The symmetry of the length of the vocal fold, the width, the proportion should be symmetric. It should be normal. And if you go to the prolonged vowels, here you might see tremor or even the spasm. And then you have to consider sentences what is maybe very rich in vowels so that you can uh, evaluate the adductor type. And for the abductor, please use voiceless consonants so that you can get a picture of quantifying the symptoms. But we are here not to talk about the spasmodic dysphonia, but also to talk the importance of performing the LEMG in this type of disorder. And I really recommend if you start to do it, use it also in the spasmodic dysphonia type because you also uh, presented the importance to map all the muscles. <laughs> what we learned from the abductor spasmodic patients, it is not a symmetric disease. You have asymmetry in the activation of the muscles. It could be that one side is much stronger. Why it is important if you inject a symmetric dose of the botulinum neurotoxin, then you get a weak voice. So you have to treat the muscle what is really affected. So that's why you have to map the muscles, CT, TA, LCA, I will show you later why, EA, the IA, what we have learned today. Uh, we have seen a patient a few weeks ago, and when this patient came in, Everybody mentioned this is a psychogenic voice disorder. And I told them, let's consider it is not psychogenic because she was like this. She was, she, or she is 45, but the, her behavior is like a child. So very shy. So everybody was expecting this is a psychogenic problem. And we invited her five days ago, extra for you, to perform an EMC. So, jetzt wird es ein bisschen mehr wehtun. Jetzt nicht schlucken, jetzt wird es kurz ein bisschen mehr wehtun. Na, 
PC allerdings. Ja, PC allerdings. Achso, der hat mich ja. nicht verstanden. Ich habe TA verstanden. Ich kann nicht vorwärts gehen, right? Because I cannot open this here. No, here. Okay, the video. There. Ah, I don't touch it. I cannot touch it. Oh, it doesn't work. It's a little longer video. I'm very sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you see that sometimes you have to go forward, backwards. She is a very nice person. Does it work? Ah, no. Ah, thank you. I go here because here it starts to become more interesting. Whatever I want to show you is very short. This is a drilling for the PCA again. We were looking for the PCA in her case. And always in the background, you hear the PCA. Again, the maneuver to, to check the swallowing. Uh, what I want to show you. Okay, very dense activity. And we did this with the PCA left and the PCA right. Luftwein. Agonistic maneuver. It was very tense. I Uh, it's stronger than the sniffing. Tief Luft drin. Und ah. Uh, Not that strong like the left side. Now, what is it? Is it really abductor spasmodic dyspnea or is it a synkinetic reinnervation? She never had the inflama inflama uh, inflammatory disease, no surgery, nothing. So there is no issue of any injury. Is it spasmodic abductor or is it maybe a cross innovation? This is really interesting. When I uh, listen to your presentation, is it a central problem either from the cortical? Or... So I'm honestly, I have no answer. But I want to share some therapeutic alternatives in spasmodic dysphonia. Mm -hmm. What you have heard so far is the use of botulinum neurotoxin for chemodenervation in spasmodic dysphonia. Yes, the chemodenervation of, uh, with um, botulinum neurotoxin, this is so far the gold standard. And we will hear after my presentation some um, comments on the surgical approaches. If you go to the literature and you go to the past, you will find controversial uh, discussions. But if you go to the future, there might be some promising surgical approaches, but this will you explain. And my issue is to talk about the neuromodulation as maybe a potential promising treatment in the future. But let's start with a few words about the botulinum neurotoxin. This Neurotoxin should cause a weakness of the striated muscles by inhibiting the transmission of the alpha motor neurons at the neuromuscular junction. And it can also uh, uh, inhibit the gamma neurons in the muscle spindles, which might order the reflex overactivity. And this is what you know from this treatment, the uh, botulinum neurotoxin uh, blocks the release of the acetylcholine, I cannot pronounce it in the right way, very sorry, of the muscles, and so it blocks the neuromuscular junction. You know that we use two types for human application, type A and type B, but in most cases, the type A, and only if you have antibodies against the type A, then we use type B products for uh, the treatment. 
So the approaches you can perform either transcutaneously, how you have seen it today, with the anterior um, injection through the cricothyroid membrane. This is, uh, ah, now I have to push this again, sorry, here. But if you want maybe to reach the PCA or the false vocal folds or the other mothers, or the, the IA muscle, then we do it also endoscopically using a bronchoscope where you can insert a long needle yeah, to do the injection. You know that you have to use a special cannula where you can see the units, what you, uh, um, what you insert very clearly. This is very important that you use such a tiny little um, injection device. Syringe. Syringe, yes. <laughs> it's late or... <laughs> So, and this is really a common approach for our patients. We developed a new approach using the ultrasound to reach uh, the LCA because we experienced that if we inject only into the LCA, we have less weaker voices afterwards. If you inject into the TA, then in most patients, you have a very breathy voice for about three weeks. And that's why we were thinking how we could do better, how we can reach the LCA. And this is what we have done here. So we use the ultrasound to find the LCA from the lateral approach, and we do the control with the ENG. And the second colleague in this case, do the injection. What I usually recommend is that you have only the amount of the botulinum neurotoxin and the syringe. Thank you. What you want to insert. If you have more, then it can happen that you uh, put more into the muscle than expected. So, and how do we know where the muscle is? We did a study with human cadavers and we used um, dye blue dye, the green and blue, to insert by ultrasound into the muscle, <clears throat> expected to have the muscle in a very little window, what you can see here. If you have in the ultrasound, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid, then you have the CT muscles. And if you turn the ultrasound probe a little bit, you have a very, very, very little window where you have the SEA. And this you can uh, um, inject with the needle easily under ultrasound control, and then you do the voicing maneuvers to be sure that it is not the CT. You ask the patient to say, if you have a high intensity, then it's the CT. You have to go a bit deeper. Yeah, and then you can inject the botulinum neurotoxin into the SEA. And with this technique, and we did the dye injection into this area, and then we dissected the, the, the larynx. And since we do this, we have a better voice quality and reduced spasmodic symptoms. And I really like this technique. The other topic I would like to share with you here is the um, approach for therapy by neuromodulation. So we would like to change the muscle spindle gamma loop by electrical stimulation, either by implants, what Pittman did in 2014, or by superficial, in this case, was it vibrotactile stimulation. And we used these ideas for own studies because their colleagues recommended, and I go back to a study by Ludlow, that the disordered inhibition in response to the sensory feedback, what we have learned today, we can alter why neuromodulation, how we do this uh, in our hospital. We have meanwhile three um, targets. One is the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. The other one is a direct simulation of the PA-LCA muscle. And the third one is a recurrent laryngeal nerve. And again, we do the same. We try to find the internal branch of the SLN by ultrasound, the same with the LCA. <laughs> then we try to find the RLN. And here again, such a positioning of the needle. You see the shadow. 
this is uh, the, 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 the shadow of the air column. And if you have the thyroid membrane a little bit above, you can find the tiny branches of the ISLM. And we have heard about the hooked wire electrodes. We do the same at the moment. We do the direct stimulation with hooked wire electrodes. ISLN, LCA, and RLN. And here we have inserted the hooked wires, and this is the patient for the stimulation. Alfred eilt ein Eichhörnchen einer einzelnen Eidechse hinterher. And if you open your ears, you might hear a difference. Hopefully. Alfred eilt ein Eichhörnchen einer einzelnen Eidechse hinterher. So this is what we try to do. So we put the hooked wires there, then we try to find the amplitude for the best voicing, and then we do 30 minutes of stimulation. This is uh, five connective days, also for one week. We do this 30 minutes, then one hour uh, break, and then we repeat the voice measurements. So we did this with the ISLN so far in more than 11 patients, meanwhile, but here we have the data available, LCA in eight patients um, bilaterally and two patients just unilaterally. I just want to show you so some ideas how to objectify the outcome. The very big problem what we are facing is that we don't have parameters for the voice quality evaluation. We can do voice range profile measurement, but the voice range profile measurement can be normal in the spasmodic dysphonia. You can do jitter, shimmer, all these measurements, they will not help in spasmodic dysphonia. And that's why we have to go back to very easy, or very um, maybe subjective parameters, counting of spasm. A person has to count the spasm in a special number of sentences. And this is what I want to show you. We had here a decrease of the number of spasms over time. You see here the baseline, the five consecutive days for stimulation. And then we did it during the stimulation and one hour after. And the same with the LCA stimulation. Then we evaluated the voice strain of these patients over the period of, uh, of the testing. Yeah. I just go quickly through the values. The only um, objective multi-parametric value is the dysphonia severity index. And what you can see is what I meant. The voice range profile can be, even in these patients, as good as normal. So that's why we might see an improvement, but it was already in the range of normal values. But what we could show is the evaluation of the pronation effort. This is the evaluation given by the patient, and you even see here an improvement over time. But so far, this is just a very limited success because one week later, the patient became uh, as bad as before the treatment. That's why we were thinking how we can continue. The patient has a very high expectations to get help. And that's why I'm very thankful to the company MedL because they provided a special device um, for the patients for superficial electrostimulation. We have tested, this is a micro stream, yeah? We tested many shapes and sizes of the, of the electrodes. We put them directly in front of the larynx and we keep them with uh, Oh yeah, with a clip band, a holder, oh, holder. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, and we did this with the patients up to six months. Yeah, and then we um, repeated our measurements. Um, first stimulation session, the second, and so forth. And the, uh, the sixth was oh, the sixth stimulation session was then um, almost. What is it, 130 durch 30? Yeah, four to six months after the beginning of the study. And also here, the same parameters, number of spasm, and to see a decrease over time. And this is really a stable result as long as you apply the superficial electrical stimulation. 
And because many of the patients had a high degree of tremor, it's not only spasmodic dysphonic uh, symptoms, you see that even the voice tremor improved over time. And again, the phonation effort improved over the treatment. So the superficial electrical stimulation provides maybe an alternative to the regular botulinum neurotoxin injection. What does it mean? Can the patient apply this stimulation therapy the whole life long? I have no idea. So far, my experience is that they will never give up to stimulate with this device. We gave them the device for about six months, but most of them wanted to keep the device. What makes it really difficult for us? But now we find that we try to find a solution that we can equip all the patients with such a device. And maybe this is the beginning of another pacemaker development, even for this patient group. And I will hand over to my colleague. Chef. Thank you. Thank you.